In this presentation, I wanted to cover um, inference. So here we're moving from this idea of descriptive statistics into inference and how we understand our population from the study sample that we have. Descriptive stats don't really allow us to make conclusions beyond our study data results. And just because we get a conclusion in our study though, it doesn't mean to say that the same is true of the population as a whole. And this is where inference comes into play. It's understanding what's in our data, what's not in our data, and what those results mean for the wider population. One way of describing this is if we had the Avengers as our study population and we found the results, uh, we applied really nice statistical models to it, we had a really great study design, but then once we get those results, we then say that those are representative of the whole population of New York City, where the Avengers are based, or we say they're representative of the human population, which isn't really going to be accurate. And that's where inference and our ability as you know, students, practitioners, academics, to understand the statistics that we run, but you know any kind of evidence that we create and kind of pull that together with our kind of real world knowledge and our expertise. So inference can be defined as a conclusion reached on the basis of evidence and reasoning. So we don't need the statistics to tell us that the Avengers is unlikely to be a representative study population that we can apply the results in a bigger scale. Statistical inference is where we use probability theory, something we'll cover in a few moments, to make inferences, so to make those judgments, those conclusions about a population from our study data. So it's just essentially using statistical models to make some of those inferences rather than making them through other kinds of judgment. Inferential stats provide techniques to allow us to decide if we can generalize our study results to the rest of the population of interest. We select our study population because we can't have access to the whole population, obviously. But we can only make inference to a bigger population if we have chosen our study population carefully to be representative of the wider population. And so this is where we get the combination of the material we've looked at in the past in terms of study design, and then David's sessions on study uh, on data collection in a quantitative way and then combining this now with the analysis framework. So those things all tie together. So for example, the results of a physiological study in young people could not necessarily be assumed to hold for older people, um, just like the Avengers example. This is why we have to think carefully about how we sample and who we sample and when we sample. For example, in surveys, we have what's called a randomized sampling framework. And so we try and gather information from a random group of individuals, but those that are representative at a certain level of the population, and then try and scale that up so it's representative of, say, the whole of the UK or the whole of Scotland, whatever our kind of wider population is that we're trying to understand. Now, in stats and statistics, um, we have a few kind of common measures I just wanted to touch on uh, in this slide. Um, effectively, these are known as effect sizes, and it's where we have outcome measures. And depending on the outcome that we're interested in, we're going to have a number of different kinds of effect sizes, outcome measures in our statistical models. Now, at this stage, it's not important to know too much about these, but in each kind of statistical model, you're going to have different um, effect sizes and effect measures that give us a clue and um, give us information about the um, size of the effect. So whatever factor is that we're interested in, how that is manipulated and changed by these other factors and how big is that effect. And I'll show some examples of that in the next few slides. But some common ones that you may already come across or you're likely to come across in your reading uh, of statistical papers or those that have obviously used some kind of quantitative method. Uh, one would be coefficients, which is where you have continuous outcomes. So again, these can have slightly different names in the literature, depending on what it is that you're looking at, what stats models have been run. But typically you have these coefficients where you're telling you something about those continuous interval or ratio measures and their effects. If you have more categorical data, particularly those with binary outcomes, which are probably the most common if we have categorical outcomes, um, if we've got outcomes with um, a series of uh, values, then it becomes a little bit trickier in some of the things that we would do. So typically you would have a binary outcome if you're going to have a categorical outcome. Categorical uh, variables are much more likely to be predictors in the model rather than the outcomes of the model. So where you do have these binary outcomes, say a disease or not having a disease, uh, people dying or not dying in a, in a study, then that's where we get things like uh, risk or hazard ratios and odds ratios, which um, in a sense 
give us an idea, give us information about similar things, but they are a bit distinct. We don't need to go into that um, for these sessions. If you do go on to look at quantitative uh, analysis as part of your ClinDoc, then you will need to start to understand some of these terms in a bit more detail. But for the stages that we're at today, you um, won't really kind of need to know too much about them. But they're just kind of measures that you're going to come across, that you're going to have to have some understanding, particularly if you delve into it. Um, the odds ratios tell us something about the odds of something happening, so the higher odds of getting a disease or dying compared to another group. And the risk or hazard ratios, again, kind of basically similar, but they tell us, again, the risk of an outcome, the hazard of an outcome, rather than the odds of having that outcome. It's a slight kind of difference, and we could probably spend um, a whole lecture and um, probably like an hour kind of talking about odds ratios and risk and hazard ratios. So we're not going to get into that in too much depth today. In terms of uh, thinking about uh, continuous outcomes, um, and this is an example where we have uh, two continuous measures, in fact. And so we've created that scatter plot that we mentioned back in the data visualization uh, presentation. And so we've got all our different points. Each of those is an individual person in our study. And this study was looking at IL-22, which is an inflammation marker, and diabetes duration, so how long someone had had diabetes for. In their study, they were interested in seeing do people who have diabetes for longer tend to have more inflammation um, in their blood. And so this study, um, as you can see here, shows this very strong kind of positive relationship. And in the scatter plot with this best fit line that you see running right through the middle, I mean, um, this is the thing about fit lines and about statistical models is that they're giving us an idea of um, they're kind of estimating some of the effect that's going on here and they're trying to pull that together based on all the individual samples that you've got in there in your study. So it's not going to be perfect and it doesn't represent individual um, risk or individual effects, but it does represent your population kind of overall effect. And these numbers at the top, um, we're kind of, we'll look at p-values uh, in the next couple of slides and we'll look at things like the R value in a couple of presentations time. But the, the R value here is your effect size, it's your correlation coefficient. That, that's essentially what that's showing you. It's telling us something about both the direction of effect here, i.e. it's positive as one goes up, the other goes up, because it's a positive number. And it's also giving us an idea of how um, the, the slope, basically there, the, the effect that's going on, the, how strong is it? So for every year we go up, how much do we go up? Uh, inflammation markers by, um, and it estimates that so that we could do that for every single um, age we want to go up, we would get an estimate of how high your inflammation levels would go up here in what we call a linear trend, because it says one, if you go from one to two to three to four, you get the same additional risk added on for each um, increasing year of age. And the p-value is telling you something about the statistical significance, which we'll look at in a couple of slides time. There's also kind of common measures you might come across, things like prevalence and incidence, um, in, particularly in health studies, that's you know, a big measure. These are relatively descriptive, and you know, this type of graph shows you these in a descriptive nature. Here it's looking at inequalities. Um, the blue kind of purple bar charts represent um, the least deprived quintile in Scotland in terms of more mortality from coronary heart disease. The kind of more blue, the higher bar charts represent the most um, deprived quintile in our population here. So this graph is essentially showing you the inequality in the risk of dying from heart disease in Scotland over 1997 to 2004. And so those bar charts show you the absolute inequality, so the rate per 100,000 on the left-hand side of the y-axis here. Um, and you can see those over time. So if we're looking at things like prevalence, that's going to be every individual year. We're considering the rates at that, uh, the levels at that point in time, the prevalence. When we're interested in over time, that's where we start to think about the measure of incidence. And here you can see generally the absolute um, levels of death by coronary heart disease in both our more deprived quintile and a more affluent quintile, if we look at the two bar charts, is going down um, in terms of absolute kind of terms, but we can see that it's going down, you know, probably kind of a bit faster in terms of the absolute rate here um, from the most deprived quintile, but it's a much uh, slower kind of decrease in the most affluent because it's starting at a much lower baseline. But then if we look, for example, here at the relative inequality measure, uh, which is this green line, we're actually seeing that the relative inequality is either actually getting worse or essentially kind of stabilizing over the period. So even though the absolute, the overall numbers are going down and things are improving in that regard, the difference between rich and poor 
again, is remaining the same, and if not, getting slightly worse over time. So there's lots of different kind of outcomes that you might have. Um, again, we could potentially look at odds ratios and risk ratios for people in terms of their risk of dying of heart disease in Scotland. Again, we can look at that over time, and that might be some of the things we want to look at in terms of outcome measures. And in the next short kind of presentation that we'll do, we're going to start looking at probability theory and statistical testing, getting a bit more in-depth into you know, what we're doing and why we're doing it in those statistical models.